Today we have a great pleasure to, to have with us Professor Iri Drogov for Goldsmith University and uh, mm, a Polish artist, uh, Joanna Rajkowska. My interest in geography has been not so much in artworks that illustrate the problematics of contemporary geography, but in the way in which sort of contemporary creative practices perform a whole set of what I think of as geographical problems. One of them is the Enlightenment project and colonial geography. And these are two very, very linked projects. Um, that have to do with the sort of mapping out of the world and the mapping out of the world from the centers of Western knowledge and um, the centers of colonial power. Another register of geography is national geography. This is a later project um, which emerges with the nation state of the 19th century and in which borders um, become one of the, the most important, restrictive, sort of operative tools of geography. So national geography aims at the kind of containment and coherence of what is within and the division of that entity from what is without. And thirdly, um, contemporary global geography which um, transcends the nation state, a, a kind of global geography that is made out of trade agreements, out of link deregulations of economies and production processes, out of the movement of capital through um, a set of, of electronic linked networks. And so a geography in which we have to think um, not about centers of production, but about a kind of diffuse model of production which is divided into a whole set of entities, assembled at other entities, distributed um, at other points of, of uh, dissemination, etc. And so we have these three registers of geography, which of course are continuously operating simultaneously. I th I'm thinking of exhausted geographies in terms of the ideological energies that are required for sustaining long-term territorial conflict, which is, I think, one type of exhaust geographical exhaustion that we're going through. And the other is the counter system to that of global geographical management which is emerging from the many economic and organizational processes that have emerged at the inter interstices of top-down macro-political globalization. Okay. No. Uh, another one is co-citizenship, Etienne Balibar's notion of co-citizenship, where he talks um, in, in a very interesting and elaborate way uh, about the the case of the sans papier um, in France and the fact that the condition of being without papers, the condition of living in a country in which you have none of the trappings of legality and legitimation should not be resolved by the simple attempt to grant legality and 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 um, and the ability to visibly participate. That instead, what is necessary in response to, to um, the condition of the sans papier is what he calls co-citizenship. Um, that the sans papier crisis needs to be taken up in order to re-examine those who have belonging, those who have citizenship. What Balibar is arguing, and I think this is a very, very important argument in order to exhaust geography, is that it is not a simple question of alleviating a condition by thinking of it as a lack, but as recognizing it as an important stimulus to re-examine our citizenship. The pressure 
from campaigns such as the Sans Papier campaign um, is one that needs to produce a shared condition of co-citizenship. So I think of co-citizenship as one of the ways of exhausting geography, of exhausting the lines of division and containment, identity, legitimation that are granted by the machinations of geography. And finally, um, ex what to me are extremely important notions and particularly important in relation to um, to kind of creative practices, and it's maybe where we might sort of, of, of have a meeting point, questions of smuggling and of contamination. And my question is, how then can we put forward an engaged discussion of place or location that is not held captive by the logics of division and containment? Who we are, where we are, what we know, what our heritages and allegiances are has always been linked to geography, not as a set of locating vectors, but rather to yoke places, to traditions and trajectories of knowledge. I've been trying to think in terms of the passage from criticism, a kind of mid-20th century model, which is about the possibility of uh, applying judgment um, of dealing with values and of being in a, in a sort of affected separation, in a state of affected separation from the thing that one is addressing. What interests me in criticality is that coming, you know, formed as I was by the operations of post-structuralist critique, um, obviously we have all of the tools at our disposal to kind of unveil and expose and, and, and um, ascertain the operations of certain kinds of truth regimes. Nevertheless, we're not separate from them because the, the, we are living out the very conditions of that which we are critically analyzing. So criticality, for me, is the joint operations of, on the one hand, being able to do the analytical world work, and on the other hand, to inhabit those very conditions that one is talking about. So it's the operation of breaking down the affected separateness of judgment, the affected separateness of criticism. Uh, the rhetoric of stable borders that are actually able to do the, the work of containment and division has to wrestle, and this is why I call these rhetorics an alibi, because they have to wrestle with a whole state of growing instabilities. One of these is so-called international terror. The, the way in which it's emerged in this most recent phase of the last decade has been through primarily spatial instability. If we think of so much of the manifestations of, inter of, of, of the workings of, of the terroristic, what we have is a kind of challenge to, the, to the, the stability of geographical borders that cannot protect Right? It doesn't really matter how many armored divisions and how much barbed wire and how many sort of, of, of regimes of control. And so the, the, the protection then moves into these kind of bureaucratic regulating mechanisms about who's allowed to come in and who's allowed to go out. Um, and going out is as much a problem as, as coming in. A parallel instability is one, uh, the one of, of global markets, where uh, production cannot be located. Um, it cannot be located neither at the level of production, nor at the level of distribution, uh, dissemination, nor at the level of, of consumption. So that, again, is a, a kind of huge challenge to the instability of classical geographies, national geographies. I wondered, you eventually went away from geography and talked about politics. Right? Um, why couldn't you talk about exhausted politics rather than exhausted geographies? <laughs> geography sustains the ability of absolutely bankrupt politics to perpetuate themselves. 
in a kind of naturalized way. And so that's why I talk about geography. And present a really gloomy project, which is called Sumpfstadt, which is a German word for swamp town. I will read the story. This is a part of my book, will be published this year by, uh, by Zero Books. And uh, I thought that that would be the best uh, kind of frame for uh, exhausted geographies. So I was focusing on Berlin while looking at Tokyo and wondering about the tragedy of landscape, which naturally led me to read about the romantic concepts of landscape and about Caspar David Friedrich. The immobility of Tokyo skyline and its quietness were overwhelming. Even the birds seemed silent. At a distance of 8,913 kilometers, Berlin also seemed far away in time. And I started to think about innocence. In Berlin, we lived near Schlossplatz, now covered in, gra in grass. Here, three years earlier, the Palaste Republic, the pride of the GDR, had been demolished. The grass was fresh. Memories of, pa of the palace, too. When we arrived in Berlin, all that remained were perfectly flat spaces, wooden walkways cutting across them, perhaps to prevent people being overwhelmed by the vast emptiness. And I started to take photographs of this place. Uh, that's a contact sheet. So one of these white green spaces had been excavated. We could see the city's buried skeleton down into the cellars of the Prussian palace, which stood there before the communist authorities decided to replace it with the Palace de Republic. I thought about the innocence of this place, trying to avoid the dangerous territory of guilt. Is it possible to think about innocence without considering guilt? The windows covered more than 8,000 square meters of the facade. The place was filled with asbestos, which helped to seal the decision to bring about its end. After the fall of communism, the decision was made to demolish it. Many artists and intellectuals rose up in its defense. Once, as a young girl, I saw the building. After the trip, I delighted in staring at my slides, showing the orange opaqueness of its innumerable windows. Its predecessor, Berliner Stadtschloss, Berlin City Palace, itself as heavy as Prussian politics, was built in the 15th century, during the reign of Frederick II Iontooth, and continuously modified thereafter. The palace was the seat of the Hohenzollern dynasty throughout the age of absolutism and until the end of the German Empire in the year 1918. This is during the revolution 1918. Um, that's another great picture from 1918. And of course, after the Weimar Republic, the palace was taking part in a, in a, um, a Nazi regime as well. And that's after the war, heavily bonked after du uh, during the Second World War and consumed by fire. It was used after the war as a backdrop for the Soviet <coughs> film Battle of Berlin. It was scarred, but much more beautiful and dramatic in appearance than it had been in, in its intact state. In the late 40s, parts of the uh, Berliner Stadtschloss were repaired and used in, as, ex as exhibition spaces. Among others, it hosted a show entitled Reunion with the Museum con Museum's Contents, which included works of art that the Nazis had labeled degenerate. The palace was finally laid to rest in 1950, when it was demolished as a symbol of Prussian militarism. Just one balcony was saved from destruction, the one Karl Liebknecht, uh, had made a speech from in 1918. It was from this balcony that Liebknecht announced the formation of the German Socialist Republic and so ended over 400 years of royal residence within the palace walls. The Bundestag finally voted to rebuild the palace 
in 2007. It was an absurd idea from a political, conservational and historical point of view. The result of a lack of vision that is the German disease of the 21st century. So we're going back in time. This is the uh, Palace Republic and this is of course the uh, Prussian Palace. And um, I bought this postcard uh, last year in Berlin. So it's a, it's a very active political campaign to really rebuild the, uh, the palace. It will be rebuilt. I thought that the most direct journey back to innocence would be a return to pre-linguistic and prehistoric times. I imagined Schlossplatz as a plot of waterlogged, unstable land covered with green foliage, sweet flag, rushes and sedges, reeds, sand dew, frogs and cranes, beavers, herons, ospreys and koipu. Fallen tree trunks, meadows, drops of dew trembling on spider webs, green slimy sludge, mud and turf. A smell that refreshes one deep down in the lungs. Cold, mist covered box and silt, layers of mouldering leaves, the organic remains of fish, frog and turtle carcasses. Dogs which strayed and fell into the water and never climbed back out. I also imagined people watching all this from various view viewing points, studying new kinds of moss and water snakes through binoculars because the swamp would be inaccessible for humans. Paradoxically, the description of the swamp made sense in Polish. In the Slavic onomatopoeic lexicon, I listened to the sounds the words made. Szmielojat, świerszczaki, drzęczki, potrzosy, trzciniaki and trzciniczki, czerwończyk nieparek and mieniak strużnik, wierzbawa, wierzba czerniawa and storczyk krwisty, not to mention kwokacze. <laughs> These would be the new inhabitants of Schlossplatz, animals and plants. So I want to distance myself at this point at, from any um, nationalistic point of view. It's just a pleasure of, of pronouncing <laughs> <laughs> uh, onomatopoeic Slavic words. The swamp was an escape. In a literal sense, it would be giving back a place contaminated by political violence into the hands of nature and an admission of complete powerlessness. Conversely, it would also be a celebration of the German romantic tradition of conceptualizing nature. It's another embodiment of, of the swamp, same place, with the uh, Liebknecht balcony kept <laughs> intact. <laughs> well, I didn't want to destroy anything, basically. Mm -hmm. I wanted to leave it as it was, but I wanted to use all this area, um, make it inaccessible for humans, <coughs> and leave it for nature, just steal it. I thought it was necessary to return to the city an area of innocence, when everything was still possible, when nature was suspended in a state of potentiality, and when history itself was still unwritten. Not only because there was no language to write it with, but because the inevitable had not yet happened. The vision of a swamp was followed by the fantasy of a spontaneous, spontaneous mass exodus of the population of Berlin in the late 40s. Just as it is necessary to desert a place contaminated by a nuclear explosion, so one should leave behind a place stained with guilt, collaboration and indifference. Columns of civilians, without any orders from the authorities, dragging the remains of their worldly goods and carts, surviving horses, pulling wagons filled with ripped duvets, dirty, impoverished children, straight from the last remaining Hitlerian squads. Women and the elderly, looking regretful by, but determined. All of this passed before my eyes. Instead of building Trimmerbergs, mountains of rubble, and uh, fastidiously restoring their townhouses and palaces, they had decided to leave their city to the forces of nature, the waters of the Spree and its tributaries canals and underground channels. The waters slowly rose and flooded sewers, filled basements, burst through manholes and ran down streets. Berlin, once again, was what it had before it became a city, a borough, 
a swamp, a marshland. I just wanted to say that thinking about exhaustive geographies, what I really like, it, like about it is that it's so hot. It's a, it's a hot thinking, you know. It's a, it's a desire, basically, that is, lies behind it. And this is why I, I could relate to it uh, with my uh, dreamy projects. Um, and I think that um, it's in a way of forcing a miracle, you know, and believing that it is possible. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So my question is, what is the relationship between geography and space and decay? Because it seems to me that there is another form of linguistic turn or a language that, especially Anna in, in her last presentation, imposes through nature, connecting nature to the act of innocence. I mean, nature is not innocent. Nature is mute. Uh, it's innocence. It's the act of ascription that makes nature innocent. Uh, so it's already a sort of a linguistic imposition onto the space, which is actually turning space into a geography, turning space into a form of boundedness uh, that otherwise would not have existed. The, the notion of exhausting geography is the notion of evacuating a set of legitimating logics or narratives that sustain a sort of whole set of politics. So the replacement of one building with another building, the, the sort of erasure of a hundred years of history in order to transcend a whole set of conflicts, which is what's happening in the, with the Berliner Schloss. Um, uh, in a way, I would want to answer you through the work of somebody that I collaborate closely with, an artist um, in Israel called Reli de Fries, who um, has has been sort of, of doing a series of projects which I always think of are a corollary to my sort of exhausted geographies. She, um, and I'll try very, very briefly to sketch two projects. One of them has to do with a plant. Um, she's a, um, a geologist and a landscape architect and an artist, and she works with all these bodies of knowledge simultaneously, informing one another. And um, she's been on the track of this plant, which is called the Akub, and it's a very, very central plant to the Palestinian kitchen. And it grows in the hills of Judea and Samaria. And it's a very unusual plant because it starts racinated. And then once it begins to bear fruit, it detaches itself from its roots and it becomes a tumbleweed. It's there. You know, th these are the kind of points of exhaustion where, where you show up the logics, but not criticize them, not say, well, this is the legacy of this and this is, you know, bad Zionist knowledge and this is bad post-colonial sort of, of, of legacies and so on. But you, in a way, t pull the rug out from under them. You say, no, that that's just a constructed geographical knowledge, right? There's a whole other geography to the region. Or there's a whole, you know, or there are plants that absolutely refuse border regimes. And they won't stay in place, you know, and, and they create weird connections between places like Gaza and the West Bank that are not allowed to have a connection. But the Akub, it moves around very quickly and it makes connections. A swamp, as we call it, is a, also a construct, you know. It's a, we invented a swamp in a way. A swamp doesn't know that it's a, it's a swamp. <laughs> so it's a construct in a construct. We, you know, the further we move the, the, you know, we're inside of the box of the box of the box. So, uh, of course, plants are not innocent, obviously, especially those who, there's one plant that um, really likes the ruins, for example. Uh, then wherever the bomb falls um, and creates a crater, this is the first plant that appears. So, you know, it's ambiguous always. But you know, this, this project has lots of contradictions. It contains, it's built on contradictions. So on one hand, it's based on romantic tradition. Of 
course, division in nature and the culture and blah, blah, blah. We're staying outside of the uh, nature. Mm -hmm. So it's also there. So it's all big lie in a way. 